Welcome to Ink and Magic, a podcast where we read and discuss the writing craft, world building, and romance of paranormal and fantasy novels. If you love books with bite, set in worlds of magic and mayhem, then you're in the right place. My name's Nikisha Shane. I go by an S. And I'm Leslie. I write as Elle Penelope. And welcome to the show. Hey, Les. Welcome back. Hey, Inez. We're back for another side changeling. We are racing through the series, it feels like. We're racing toward this point where we're, we finally gotten to the point where I hadn't read any further, I realized. I had to actually buy this book because I <laughs> was, one, was not already on my Kindle. <laughs> so the book in question is Tangle of Need. It's Audria and Riaz's story. We met them both in the last book. Right. And it came out in 2012. I've been trying to keep up with the timeline of release dates just for my own edification. 12 years ago at the time of this recording. And you said that I told you don't bother with this book at the time. See, that's the interesting thing about this too. Because it's almost like we're not critiquing it in a sense. (laughs) We're kind of listening to what our past selves said. Because we have different experiences now. But I apparently said that it, it was not good. Yeah, from what I recall from 12 years ago, you were like, just skip it, just move on to the next one. And I was like, okay. And for some reason, I so I did skip it. I bought the next one, but I don't think I actually finished or or started reading the next one. Either way, we need I'm I'm excited for us to have that conversation because you made a prediction. I think what happened was I read some spoilers and Uh, I probably told you what I read. That is a thing that sounds like a thing I would have done. Well, I have attributed to you just figuring it out because I don't know if we talked about this on the show, but both Leslie and I are Whovians. And if you're not, you have to be a Whovian to even understand this. And Leslie figured out who River Song was. Oh, and I rem- Leslie, I remember where I was really? when you told me this. Wow. Yes. I do figure things out, and I did actually figure the, out the next book early. But I also read spoilers, so <laughs> maybe it was it was either a combination of I had I had the suspicion we should be really not be talking about the next book, talk about this book. But I had the suspicion of who the ghost was, books and books ago, and I must have shared that with you. And yeah, and and because at the time I you know I was all on the message boards and what were we doing in two thousand twelve? What was the thing? Facebook, <laughs> MySpace, I don't know. <laughs> I hadn't figured out texting yet. Blogs. There were some blogs. And yeah, I had been like having my suspicions. I, there was two people that I thought it was. And I was like, oh, no, it's got to be. It was some so. good head fakes in this book about who the ghost was. Because there was a lot of side POVs in yes. this book. Yes, there were. And I had been narrowing it down at the time, you know, reading them. But at that point, a, a year apart, you know, because I think we had caught up a few books in. And so... Anyway, but that is not this book. Yes, next book. Yeah. This book is Tangle of Need. <laughs> it is. And so I'm guessing the reason she labeled because she we had ha- so we had started having conversations about what's up with these titles. And the need is an interesting notion um, in the title. Also, Tangle. She uses the word Tangle in this book a lot. I made notes of it because I was like, ooh, Tangle, Tangle, Tangle. I get it. I get the title now because you've used Tangle many times. Huh. I did I didn't think of that. <laughs> I thought I thought about the plot dynamic of want versus need, because that's what I thought this oh. book was about. So in in the plotting world, um, and I learned this in TV plotting and now apply it in novel writing, but we talk about the difference between when a character has a goal. Mm-hmm. And that goal is a want. It's like a red herring. It's a really a false goal. Right. It's like the t- um, like in the the teeny bopper rom coms where the nerdy girl she thinks if she just gets a makeover she'll get the popular guy. Yeah. And that's 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 what she wants. She or she thinks that if she popular. just dates the popular guy she'll be happy and everything will be better. Mm-hmm. And that's the want. But the need is really self love and to see the nerdy guy who really likes her or whatever. And we love it. We fall for it every single time. And that's really what was going on here with these two, with both Audria and Riaz. We know from the previous books, because Audria is Indy's play sister. It's her aunt, but they're so close in age that they might as well be sisters. Um, And we saw Audria with a man who everybody said is just wrong for her because Audria was a strong woman and Martin was not a strong man. He he wasn't dominant as a wolf. 
And it was the basis of Indigo's romantic conflict with Drew, that she had seen her close, you know, her play sister like that, you know, in this relationship. And that was terrible for everybody. And she was not doing that with a non-dominant or a less dominant man. So yeah, we've, this conflict has, and also then we also met Riaz who, in, who had uh, confided in Indigo in the last book or in Indigo's book that uh, he had met his mate and that she was already married to a good man. And so and in love with him. And in love they with were him. happy. Yeah. So we've already set up these two people are going to have a really hard time. And for me, I was like, well, what if Adria was really standing behind his mate? You <laughs> thought it was her. You know, like I was just trying to twist and turn it. And then it became really clear, like, no, it was a different country, different continent. <laughs> oh I wanted it to be the mating so much. I just wanted to find some way around it. <laughs> That's precious, Leslie. That's so precious. But so, so we get into this book. And the first thing that we learned about when we get into this book is that the, the, the prologue was about the net and that the net is dying. And that was a huge subplot of this book, the yeah. dying net. Yeah. I, and I wrote prologue, dun, dun, dun. <laughs> that was basically the tone of the prologue. Like, it's getting real bad in here, y'all. It's, it's about to collapse. Yeah. And I felt like it took the subplot, that subplot, which was important, I felt like that took over a lot of the story. And a lot of the um, Leslie called it the party line. <laughs> took this over was a party line. line story. This was, you know, it's Riaz and Adria to a certain degree, but it's a lot of other people, a mm -hmm. lot of other people. Mm -hmm. And sometimes she gives us books that are mainly the couple, like Dev and Katya, Max and Sophia. I think are mainly that couple. And then there's these books that have to connect their nodes, or they're, maybe they're anchor books. They're connecting a lot of different plot lines together, checking in with a lot of different people. And you still have the love story, but it was almost, the love story was almost the subplot of this book because there were yep. so many other things happening. Yep. And that can be tough in a romance. Like when I'm coming to it and I really, and it's got a great juicy romantic conflict like this one did, I really just wanted to get back to them all the time. You know, unless I'm with Judd, <laughs> I've always loved being with Judd. <laughs> Anybody else? Like, okay. <laughs> Not all the time, but you know, I'm joking. But like, it was just a lot of other things happening in this book. And I'm sure it's setting up things for the future that we need to know that are really important. And yeah. they weren't uninteresting things for the yeah. most part. Uh, I could have done with a little less Sienna and Hawk because we had their book. And it seemed like it, this was like a spillover of some of their conflict and resolution as much as it was setting up external plot lines you know i felt like the sienna and hawk plot line was an after the after after the happily ever after right right but i appreciated it okay. and here's why i appreciated it because one of the th one of the reasons that i think you and i both don't appreciate about age gap romance is we're always thinking okay so what are y'all going to talk about yes <laughs> <laughs> You don't have to share the same. Literally, they do not like the same music. They do not have the same friend group. They they have they have a, two decades between them. What are y'all going to talk about outside of the bedroom? Mm -hmm. And she she put a lot of those. Nalini saying put a lot of those problems with Sienna and Hawk on the table because it's not very long after their book, and they're a, in this book they have their basically their wedding, which was their mating ceremony, and so we. We get to walk through that and we see um, like Sienna's like, hey, you want to come hang out with me and Maria and her boyfriend? And Hawk was like, yeah, babe. No, that's <laughs> not going to happen. happen. Sorry. <laughs> but, he, but he makes, but, and at first I was like, ew. But then he was like, I am their alpha. Right. That I can't, they can't see me like this. However, she, he could always bring her around his friends because yeah, his friends were the lieutenants mm -hmm. and the senior soldiers. And these were all kids. So I, I mean, I, but I got it. Yeah. I mean, there, there were things like, okay, how is Sienna going to be made it to the alpha? She's basically the first lady of the church. You know, she's the first lady <laughs> of the pack and that's a responsibility. Uh, Cause you've got your preacher who's in charge, but the first lady has definite responsibilities. And when she shirks on them, the congregation suffers. So that is what's happening here. She's got to figure out a way to not just get the respect of everybody, but learn everybody and, and be his true help me, be able to be a sounding board. So she has to have the same knowledge and relationships. And I did appreciate that, like seeing, okay, after the wedding, when it's the nitty gritty of 
real life in this pack? And how is she going to help him keep it together and keep it strong? Because she loves it too. And she's only 19 going on 20 or however old she is. So yes, that seeing how that played out is actually kind of cool. Um, so I can take back some of what I said, because I did really appreciate that as I was reading it. It was just, I wanted to get back to other things. And it wasn't perfect. Like she goes to hang with the, the maternal females mm -hmm. and it doesn't go well. But at the same time, Hawk gives her perspective of it doesn't look like they're opening up to you and they might not like actually be opening their mouths up to you, but they're inviting you into spaces where few are allowed into so you have to keep you have to keep showing up yeah and like, i don't want to do this <laughs> and they're going to make you pay your dues too they're mm -hmm. not just going to be like hey sit down like it's going to be a little bit they're trying to feel you out they're making sure which is natural it's a little bit of hazing maybe in their own way definitely um, <laughs> that's yep. important to go through you know it makes you stronger it makes you actually connect more so so there was that um subplot um and there were more and we'll probably get to them but that was your that we're, we're i guess we are interluding the same way that we were being interluded on, <laughs> on the party line yeah yeah but i mean okay if we go back to riaz and adria it's it starts out he's like why is she being such a bitch to me <laughs> essentially like adria was just being cold and you find out quickly it's because she's intensely attracted to him and she does not want to be so she is just broken up with martin from indy's book uh, apparently they had been not really together for a year and she's back in the pack. You know, she's come back to the den and Riaz has both come back to the den. So they both are outsiders coming back in after a long period away. And she, she really is attracted to him and he realizes he's very attracted to her. And we do, I, I was like, Oh, are we getting sex in chapter one or chapter two? Cause that's when they make out, they, they give in. And it seems like a, it's a surprise to him. And, and he's really angry because he feels like he's betrayed his mate. And that sense of betrayal causes him to be an asshole <laughs> to her, quite frankly. And she also is like, I'm not ready for anything. I don't want anything. I got out of this long, terrible relationship. They're both in bad places. And it's a, it's, you know, it's a really big hole for them to start out at. Yeah. They, I felt like they both were mean to each other from, from jump. True. Um, and, and yeah, there is a, they, 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 there's, there's not necessarily sex. Early, but there's a finger bang very early. <laughs> very early, yeah. So, like, hey, what? yeah. I was thinking Inez will love this because she hates <laughs> slow burns. <laughs> and then it got slow. It did get slow. They um, had a lot to work through. They did. They did. And that's that's one thing that I don't like. I don't. And, and I'm trying to write a book like this right now, where the hero has this shame and guilt that he has feelings for the heroine. Mm -hmm. And I don't like that. I like, I like alphas and even cinnamon rolls who are like, that's what I want. I'm going to go after it. Mm -hmm. Where Riaz was like, I am, uh, I'm, I'm crap. I should not feel this way. I just want to have sex with this woman. That is not the gentlemanly <laughs> gentle wolf thing to do. <laughs> And he's constantly beating himself up over it. And I don't like that. It, and it goes through levels. At first, it's like, I vowed celibacy. Since I yeah. can't have my mate, I'll have no one. And then it's like, well, maybe I can just have sex with her. But that's not enough. And that's, you know, not the gentle wolf thing to do. And can, I can't use her, you know. And then it's like, oh, actually, my wolf is on board with this. And I need her. And it was a, it, it didn't take that long. I mean, it took a little while. But it eventually becomes like a chase. Like, he's into it. It He's took a third of the book. You know I clocked it. Okay. <laughs> it took a third. Of, they were at each other's throats, back and forth. And then one of them would be like, oh, I really shouldn't have been that mean. Let me go extend an olive branch. And the other one would bite the hand that tried to extend the branch. And then it would go vice versa. And I felt like that went on for a while. I did feel like um, Audria had like a mini transformation they both had transformations before they got together mm -hmm. where they both had to take a minute and kind of forgive themselves. Audra forgiving herself for her relationship with Martin, which I just thought was so interesting, Leslie. The, the, the notion of a dominant woman, and I don't know if submissive man is the right thing to call Martin, her, her ex-boyfriend. Non-dominant. He is non-dominant. But we even saw in, um, in Indy's book, that he was so passive aggressive. 
mm-hmm. like grossly passive aggressive with her. Right. And she, in her in, in her inner monologue, she's going, she's recounting that, and yeah. how he turned it against her to keep her. Yeah, it was that was abusive. I don't know if we'll call it abusive, but it was a nuanced portrayal of a bad relationship, and that it started really good. And they kept through it. And he had been super supportive. And then she, he saved her life. So there was some guilt and you know, guilt there about that. That's kind of what kept her. And there must have been some level of love. I mean, she goes back and she says, he never loved me. And I don't know if that, I mean, who knows? But like, it seems like there was some strong feelings there, but it got away from them because of the dominance issues. And then a fundamental lack of respect or just insecurity, you know, the passive aggressive aggressiveness on his part seemed to be the insecurity taking place and there was some gaslighting maybe it was a nicely nuanced portrayal of this you know a relationship that you know like some like so many of them do start fine start good they seem they seem okay and then slowly because of over time it just chips away and falls apart so she's been through that and she does not want to do it again and she sees the potential of that happening with her and Riaz because she knows that this is this is not going to be loving and she needs she knows she needs that but at the same time they both need they're both they're touch starved yes the whole first third of the book they are touch starved and their wolves are not having it the wolves are like we need this because it's like they're almost not in control of their bodies when they get together they like crash into each other and start making out and then one of them will say something mean or be mean and then they'll go away hurt and the next time they see each other it's on again so it's that kind of thing where mm-hmm. it's that not the human i feel like the wolves were in control of that aspect of it definitely but at by the time that they make, and she even off early on before the first third, when they decide, let's, let's do this. She even, Audrey even offers him. She's like, you know, we can just bang it out. We can just be friends with benefits. And he's like, I don't like you. Yeah. That was early on. He's like, I don't want you in my bed. And she was like, oh, okay. Well, I will never ask you again. This is the last time I liked her strength. Mm-hmm. I liked her, even though she's hurting and she's attracted to him. She's like, I don't want to be second best all throughout, you know, also, but you 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 gonna have to ask me because this is it, and then eventually he does. He kind of he does a lot of good groveling, mm-hmm. I guess you could say, and he has to grovel a couple of times. Yes, he does. <laughs> but it's good groveling. If you like groveling, he's got some good examples. So, one of the things that we didn't mention is that Riaz is a lone wolf, mm. and so he prefers his solitude. And Hawkstad was a lone wolf. We didn't really talk a lot about Hawkstad in Hawk's book, but Hawkstad was also a lone wolf. And as soon as he found his fated mate, he, a flip switched on. And they they talk about how lone wolves are they they are on their mates. There's a dedication. There's a, there's there's they're even more alpha when it comes right. to their fated mate, which is really interesting to me that Riaz is a lone wolf. He falls for this woman. But that was human, right? I don't ever. Yeah, she was in the Human Alliance. Human Alliance. That's what. Okay, yeah. I got confused. He doesn't um, fall for her, but he meets his mate, who was Lizette. Yeah, Lizette is who Riaz's wolf believes is his mate. She's married. She's happy. Um, <clears throat> and it was interesting to me that this lone wolf meets his fated mate and. He says that he tells when he when he finally confides it in Hawk, he said, I fell to a million pieces and died when mm-hmm. I realized that I was not gonna have this woman and I had to walk away from her. Yeah. So whereas Indy is her heart is broken. I, sorry, Adria. whereas Adria, they're they're practically sisters. <laughs> whereas in Adria's heart is broken, like splintered, walking around, beating and broken. Riaz is in pieces. Like these people are wounded. Yeah. But they do, they do take the time. And that's why I was patient. I I was quite a patient in that first third, because you could see that there was a lot of self-work going on with both of them. They were not nice to each other, but they were learning to be kinder to themselves. And that was interesting to me. I agree. Yeah. That that they both have these transformations, which is really powerful and kind of didn't seeing them coming from the beginning where she's mean and then he's mean and then they're working it out. And he kind of decides by the time of Hawk and Sienna's mating ceremony, he's really seeking her out. 
Yeah. And this is, you know, a few chapters after he was like, I never want you in my bed. And he has to eat crow a little bit. And they he takes her away from the dancing because she's dancing with other people and he's jealous. As the lone wolf, even though this is not his mate, he seems to be just as over the top for this woman who he's attracted to and then eventually falls in love with. So it's not, it brings up interesting questions. The entire book brings up interesting questions about what is the value of mating mm -hmm. if you can reject it or if you ha are forced to not be with your mate and you're just a regular person who's got to fall in love the old-fashioned way and choose to be with them every day that is that's a really cool thing in this world to bring in especially in book 11 yeah i agree and another thing that i agree with is that um at some point after they're together at some point um in, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep messing up and saying Indy. I'm Adria. sorry, <laughs> Adria. Um, at some point, um, Adria. Um, as they, when no no no. At some point, Riaz is having a conversation with Hawk, and they're talking about. Um, he, he goes to Hawk because Hawk had the same thing happen with him, where his mate died young, but he found Sienna and they were able to bond. And Riaz is worried. He's like, what if, what if it's not there? What if I can't bond with her? Um, what if she doesn't accept me? And Hawk reminds him that it's the woman that chooses. Mm -hmm. That was so interesting to me. Because as these two get together, you see, you see Riaz constantly chasing her in, in the good way now. Mm -hmm. And you see um, Audria, she's like, I would choose him, but she's she's one foot in, one foot out because she's constantly expecting him to walk away from her. Right. Because she knows that she is not his fated mate. Right. Yeah. And it's logical. It's self-preservation. You know, if a, and the mate hasn't died, so the, who knows? I mean, she's married now, but, and especially, you know, we get to the end. That is a very realistic reaction. And for me, you know, questioning him, like he gets it, but at the same time, he still wants her and he still chases her. And whenever I don't, I wasn't clear exactly when he went from, I'm betraying my mate from even kissing someone else to, I must have Adria. You know, there's a, a switch that flips um, somewhere along the line and it mm -hmm. becomes the thing that is driving him. And he's like, I can't have her. I'm going to choose her. And so he makes that shift early on and it takes the rest of the book for Adria to accept it and to accept him completely. Because yeah, what woman in her right mind would be like, Hey, you've got a maid who just happens to be married, but being a wolf and knowing the importance of the bond. I felt like he was territorial. Mm -hmm. I felt like that was him being territorial. Um, and not wanting anybody to dance with her, oh, yeah. wanting wanting her attention, and wa I felt like that was him being territorial before his feelings had been engaged, really. Yeah, mm -hmm. because they they are together. They're sleeping together every night. They're constantly together. They're working together. They're basically friends. They become friends with benefits, and then they get an operation that they have to go to. In Venice. I wonder who was in Venice, Leslie. This is Chekhov's gun. Lizette, the mate, lives in Venice. This is where he met her. So we're all expecting. We know Lizette has to show up on the page. She has to. We're expecting it to happen in Venice. And it does not happen in Venice. Which was shocking. That was because this is and this is the, the point of time where I am overwhelmed by all the plot that is happening in this book. There was a lot of stuff. Because we haven't going talked on. about the arrows and no. the ghost and no. Caleb and mm -hmm. Vasquez and, and what the human alliance are up to. And no. Ding and <laughs> yeah. A lot. Henry Scott and everybody, everybody's in this book. Everybody's it's a party in this book. line. But they go to Venice and yeah, you're we're all leaning forward expecting Lisette to show up and for there to be a real test of this mating. Well, real test of this relationship. Riley and Mercy. Sorry, I'm just continuing to the <laughs> other plot. <laughs> yes. Oh, everybody. Um, but Lisette doesn't show up. And I thought that that was brilliant. That was a brilliant head fake. Yes. On Alini Singh's part. I really appreciated that she did that. 
Right. She, she pushed it further. She got to push it to the dark moment. Actually, she did she push? She pushed, which it. is where it makes sense to be. But I was still expecting it to be in Venice. <laughs> So that gun did not go off in Venice and they have a really good time in Venice and they get closer Yes, in Venice, which was really, really nice. And after Venice is when Riaz realizes that he wants more than just sex from this relationship. But the thing is, you would think that Audrea wants that too, but she panics mm -hmm. because she starts to have memories of when she would start bending herself and in contorting who she was in order to make her ex Martin happy. And she's afraid that's about to happen to her again. Yeah. And then that, that totally makes sense too. Um, but he, he, there's a point in Venice where they both are in the hotel room and they both shift into wolves and sort of just like nuzzle on the bed as wolves, which I didn't understand it, but I thought it was an interesting scene. We haven't, we don't see a lot of them as their animals overall in the series. Uh, and so that's just another example of them being closer, their, their wolves being closer. Because at that point, the humans are, are kind of on board, but yet we've already said the wolves are definitely there. And uh, I thought that was a cool way to, to really show that. Mm -hmm. So he's making serious moves when they get back. Riaz is. He invites her to meet his family. He makes her move in with him, even though they've been sleeping together every night. Makes and he sense. makes her commit. Like, uh, there's this, this is just going to be the two of us. We are monogamous. We're together. Yeah. And we're at like the halfway. This is probably the midpoint of the book, or just maybe just past the midpoint. Past the midpoint. Because but, that loader gun is about to go off. Well, he's by the time that he's being very dominant, he's being dominant in bed. So we know that the dominance isn't an issue like it was for Adrian Martin. It's this other, this other, um, conflict but yeah come meet my mom meet my family have dinner at the house like it's they're they're all um what is it called wife he's wifing her up <laughs> he's totally wifing her up completely wifing her up so this is a perfect time and other stuff happens there's a lot of plot a lot of a lot of other stuff is happening a lot alice i didn't mention alice in the list oh my God. Okay. Yeah, so those are the emails right so um you know the epigraphs we can call them ever. Oh my gosh, I will never get this right. Anyway, so those little in between sows that, that um, Nalini Singh likes to do this time, and there are very few, but it's emails about Alice between um, Lara, Tammy, Lara, Ashaya, Ashaya's sister, Sasha, and Sasha. Yeah. They're trying to figure out how to get Alice. Remember the human woman that we met? Um, via emails in the last book they're trying to figure out how to get her out of her cryogenic coma, coma state right and i oh my gosh why can't i remember a shy sister but she's freaking hilarious um, amara or amara, amara thank you at one point amara's like why do you make me she to to communication just to a shy she's like why are you making me stay on this email chain when we it's such an inefficient way to communicate she's just her psychopathic hilarious self and then at one point Ashaya's asking I can't remember how this came about but Ashaya asked her something about like how she said how are you and she's and, and Mara's like yeah, I'm functioning fine she's like Ashaya's like no how are you and she and Amara has to think about it and then she was like this has happened in the office and oh this guy looks like he's interested in me which is a completely fool's errand <laughs> I, just, I want it more <laughs> yeah I was like are we getting an Amara book I or hope so. novella like can they take her yes. to the point where, I, I don't know, that, that's a heavy lift, but I would, I, I know nothing. <laughs> oh my goodness. So then, yeah. So then, um, and this is when we find out that Mercy and Riley are having triplets mm -hmm. or at least. We don't know if it's triplets. We, we find out they're pregnant and then. more than two. We know it's more than two babies. Well, no. Okay. And the way that we know, we know something is that Faith sees something, but she won't tell. She's just laughing her head off about it. And she's really vague. She's like, there's going to be babies. She's like, I didn't say when and how many. But she make it. So she's basically torturing them with this knowledge. Right. And then Mercy and Riley are like, huh? <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> pregnancy is kind of rare. But I think when shifters, when changelings have babies, they do have more multiples. I just wrote down triplets question mark. So. <laughs> well, hopefully we'll see. Just, we'll well, out. yeah, I mean, we got a year and plenty more books to come. <laughs> but anyway, during all this, um, Lisette turns up in San Francisco. 
Right, because the human alliance, there is a whole subplot. They went to Venice to talk to the humans. There's stuff going on. The humans have found a chip that allowed them to be immune to psychic interference in their brains. This was a Shia's chip. It was based on a Shia's chip, yes. And they were able to figure it out. And so now that they're working with the human alliance, they needed somebody, a liaison. And so Lizette, who had worked for our company, is, of course, the liaison and is going to move to San Francisco and has separated from her husband. Of course. Of course. Of dun, course dun, dun, dun. Yeah. Um, and this scene was interesting because we don't really get like what relationship um, Riaz and Lisette had. They'd worked together. They knew each other. Yeah. And they had both felt something because of this mating bond. She didn't, she being human had no idea what was happening. But even now she, she confides in him about her husband. And she's like, I don't know why I, I feel so comfortable around you. Something's happening, but he won't tell her and she shouldn't tell her, which is, you know, but it's like that the mating bond was real because I was still at this point, we're like in chapter 61, you know, 10 chapters from the end, like maybe it wasn't a real mating, maybe was, like looking for these loopholes to this mating bond. But by all accounts, it was a real mating bond. If she had not been married, this would have been his mate. But he has already made the decision that he is down for Adria and this this divorce, this uh, separation is not changing his mind. Adria finds out, however, mm -hmm. and I just was heartbroken. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. It's happening to her again. Like yeah. she, she's falling for a guy who is not going to be there 100 percent for her. Um, and we even see um, Ad Riaz says when he's having this conversation with Hawk, he's like, Adria is mine. I'm not giving her up. And Hawk asks her, well, where's where does the wolf think? Where's the mating bond think? He's and Ria says the mating tug is towards the set. But there's no mating dance. There's no mating dance happening between the two of them. Right. Because she hasn't accepted. And they're not even near each other. So yeah, there's no mating dance at all. So basically, Hawk tells him, okay, you know, I can't help you too much with this. You need to go talk to Dalton, who is our mm -hmm. librarian, who has kept all this information in his brain. <laughs> and he gives him some interesting information. So it's like, he tells of these territorial wars, which we've heard of for books and books. We didn't really know exactly what was happening. We get the most information we've ever had about these wars, which apparently included changelings versus each other. And in those times of war, there had been instances of mating bonds between warring packs, and they had to reject each other. And, you know, unfortunately, those they were killed soon after, so no one knows what would have happened with them and other people. But it's an open question as to what happens when a changeling rejects their mate, and how can they find love again? And Dalton basically tells Ria, it's like, you can answer this question for us, maybe. It kind of leaves it open, so we just don't know. There haven't been enough examples. Mm -hmm. There's some hope. You know, it's a little tiny, tiny crack of hope. Yeah. And meanwhile, Adria has moved out of his place. She is putting distance between them. But Riaz, he's not giving up. He wants, he says he wants Adria. Right. And I wrote down that uh, Riaz pulls Drew. <laughs> <laughs> he starts to leave presents oh, yeah. and just basically badger this woman into paying attention to him again and basically gets the pack on his side. And Hawk, ever the matchmaker he is, has his hands and thumbs all up in it. He had his hand in this relationship from the beginning, I felt like. And he's just egging the whole thing on. I guess that's what your alpha is supposed to do. It's supposed to force you together, make you work together, make you figure out your differences. Adria goes into the mountains for three days trying to get away from her, him. Um, that's when she actually right. has her closure with Martin because Martin comes to find her. Yeah. And they have a nice little scene where it's just like, I think he apologizes. He does. And she's able to let some stuff go, which which is needed. Yeah. For her to move forward. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know if this was really important, but um, Riaz figures out that Adria is a maternal dominant. Right. That's the first time we've heard of that. So she chose to be a soldier. She could have gone to the maternal females, but it, it's because she is dominant, but also incredibly empathetic. And he's noticed that within her bef before. And that's why she knows she can't just have a physical relationship. She is, you know, she needs family security. She wants kids, all that whole thing. 
Yeah. And so she's working with the kids. She's been assigned to work with the kids in some capacity. I can't remember. The submissive kids. She's working with the submissive kids to teach them, to train them. Right. Yes. Because even the submissive wolves, the, the war is coming. They know the Psy are out of pocket and there's going to be some bad stuff happening. So everybody needs to train up. And yeah, so she, being a dominant maternal wolf, I'm, I guess that'll be important in the future. I don't know. It's something we haven't heard of before. It is something that we haven't heard of before. Um, but we're near the end of the book where this happens. And um, Hawk, uh, Hawk, Riaz goes to see the scent. And it, it looks like they, they're they about to have a heart to heart. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing about that heart to heart is Hawk's, Hawk. Riaz is like, I'm not in love with you. And the set, it's, the, the, the page is like, the page says that she looks relieved. She's like, I'm not in love with you either. I love my husband. <laughs> yeah. And then she looks past Hawk. Oh my God, why do I keep doing that? And then she looks past Riaz and who is standing there but her husband. And he is, Riaz, of course, has orchestrated this uh, reunion because, you know, her husband had only asked her to go because he was sick and is going to have to go to the treatment. It was romance reason. So they can get back together as they should be. I mean, and that's, you know, Riaz and Adria, they've handled Riaz's mate. My question is, what about Adria's mate? She has a mate out there somewhere too. That's going to pop up. But maybe. Does she? But does she? Because does everybody get a mate? It's so celebrated. Does everybody, mm. does this happen for everybody? I don't know. I felt like this book was all about the magical mating bond versus free will and choice because Adria and Riaz were choosing each other. And in fact, the book ends, before we get back to all the other plotting stuff, the book ends with um, Adria, um, Riaz pointing to two humans that are celebrating a hundred year, their hundred year anniversary back mm -hmm. where they met. And they're like dance, slow dancing, like really slow dancing. Um, and he was like, they, they're not changeling. They yeah. made the choice to stay together for all this time. We can do it too. And that was a really powerful message. I, I did appreciate that a lot because, you know, the fantasy of these kinds of romances is the faded mate thing, but mm -hmm. you know, our reality is not like that. So real love, real relationships are a choice every day, all the time. You have to keep choosing and having that reinforced here is really beautiful. So even though I didn't get my magical mate mating bonds <laughs> popping up between them. We're for trying hard. <laughs> magical changeling reasons. I, I see why we didn't. Like, you know, that probably would have ruined everything. So. <laughs> yes. So some other stuff happened in this book. Oh, there's oh a lot. Goodness. There's a lot of stuff. So we talked about Sienna and Hawk and uh, all their domestic scenes, as well as um, their wedding. And then their um, Ming tries to, to come after her and kill her. Well, he comes after her. They actually have a meeting. He teleports in. Then he's like, I'm not going to kill you. I'm going to try to bring you over to my side because you're an asset. You could be powerful. And Sienna is like, I don't think so. Here's some cold fire for you. <laughs> <laughs> and he teleports out. So she whips him. And now he's like, okay, she's got to die. He was going to just try to salvage her. Um, one important thing that during Hawk and Sienna's mating ceremony, the ghost has managed to get into changeling territory and observe unseen unnoticed by anyone you're right i didn't even i didn't even put two and two together but yeah well it was from his pov as the ghost uh it didn't click and like this okay. is how i make a bad soldier <laughs> i just you know i was like a what's up with all of the security that they have you know this this ghost figure is able to circumvent it but it was a really you know we'll see how it plays out in future books, but like I just thought that was a really interesting scene where the ghost is silent, the ghost is, you know, for an advocate of Psy. But you can tell that this character is looking at this scene of love and connection with maybe envy or longing to the edge of their silent abilities, you know. So yeah. yeah. That was kind of cool. There um we talked about the human alliance and how they've got the chip. And yes. The chip has been implanted in Bowen and they brought in Judd to see if Judd could get past the defenses and he couldn't. Yeah. And there there was an interesting part where um the I think was I think it was Riaz and Judd were having a discussion about should we tell the humans in our pack? 
and give them the decision. Right. And that was an interesting discussion. I think Riaz was, was saying, no, that's not how, yeah, Riaz was saying, no, that's not how PAC works. Well, um, Hawk, I think if they eventually do want to have them, but it's they want to test it first some yeah. more. They, they're not satisfied with the amount of testing that has been happening, which is basically just immediate human trials very quickly. So I can yeah. see the reticence. But yeah, like once they think it's safe, then they'll give their human people the option, or I don't know if they'll ever force them, but the, the option to do it because humans are very susceptible to sigh. Yeah. yeah. And that's a big fear. Yeah. And then there were a lot of sigh. <laughs> well, a lot of arrows. We have Vasek and Aiden a lot. They are coming to help Judd. Mostly they help. There's a point at which at the end where pure sigh, we haven't mentioned them yet, really. And Henry, you know, Henry, we thought he might've been killed in the last book. He's still alive for much of this book, pulling some strings. He has set his sights on destroying some anchors in the net, which kills thousands and thousands of Psy. So because his thought is if if I truly show how disabled the, the net disabled, everybody will rally around it to make it pure again. Yeah. That's some cold logic, man. Right, because he knows he's gonna kill a lot of his own people. Mm -hmm. And so Nikita and Anthony and who Caleb. are and Caleb is not really, because I'm saying Nikita and Anthony get the, the support of the changelings to help to help to protect these anchors. Mm -hmm. And so that's like the, the the a lot of trust being shown because you know the anchors are vital to the Cynet. And so we've got scenes of you know them protecting these Psy anchors. And and also we're told that Psy, just normal everyday Psy, were helping to protect changelings during the battle that happened in the last book. So we're getting more crossover which pure Psy hates, we're getting more collaboration and protection. And we're seeing that, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, even silent Psy know the difference between right and wrong and they will help protect innocence. Yeah, yeah. Because they saw that the count, though, this is the other thing. Did I miss the dissolution of the council? Because every time they were like former counselor, former counselor, I was like, wait, did, did there, was there actually a formal dissolution? Yeah, there was not a formal one. It was just like maybe two books ago when we, we know that there's a split somehow in the last book they were like it's not really functioning but i don't think most side even knew that so yeah the whole former counselor thing seemed a little premature because yeah. it hadn't officially dissolved yeah but they were being technical yeah <laughs> they were being technical um and i i guess that was the the big bad the big battle of this is when um riaz and adria they go to protect an anchor um, and Riaz is injured and Adria protects him, which was great. But that was the, that was pretty much the big battle because I mean, you had like two arrows there, like, <laughs> well, the arrows show up later to clean up. And then, you know, we learn a little bit more about Aiden and basic and, oh, then basic actually goes to kill Henry. Uh, so that's, it's a little, is it anticlimactic or is it just who else could have done it? I don't know. We find out Aiden, I mean, Vasek is kind of suicidal. Like he's hanging on to do some specific things, but he's a whole mess. And he had an end game. Yeah. And then all along, Caleb is looking for someone who we've known this very vaguely for a couple of books. He's searching the net. He's been searching for years and years. Finally, in the first real cliffhanger of the series, I think, the very last chapter, he finds this person, this well-hidden person in a white cell. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah, dun, 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 dun. I think I think the reason for all of the psi um POVs on the party line is was is to set up the next few books. Mm -hmm. But also um one of the things that we 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 realize about the arrows is they do not they do not want they don't want pure psi. They also don't want silence to fall because we have seen the horrors of their lives without silence mm -hmm. so i i kind of felt like we had the council that was the big bad and certain counselors that that started to fall like dominoes mm -hmm. i felt like this was one of those times where you strip away the villain to reveal a bigger bad so it's like how are you going to overcome now these arrows who are like we 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 were not for pure psi but we will not let silence fall Oh, I didn't see that at all. I don't think they're going to be a villain. I mean, the heroes of the next couple of books are... Yeah, so so maybe I didn't say it well enough, but we've stripped away the council. conflict. Right. The bigger conflict is the fall of silence and how is it not going to kill all Psy and mm -hmm. then ripple out 
So I think the arrows, um, Aiden and Vasek are the basic arrow leadership right now. I mean, Caleb mm-hmm. is sort of in charge of them nominally. Like they're going to do what they want to do. Yeah. They're going to ally with people. They don't, they don't want destruction. You know, they're really for themselves and they want to protect people, I think. So, yeah, I don't see them being a big or bad. I feel like they want to protect silence. I don't know. I think they know that silence, I mean, they, the net's broken. They know that. Mm-hmm. And I think they're realistic in that silence is going to fall. Like, I think maybe they're trying to mitigate the damage, perhaps. I don't know. I just didn't get the, the feeling that against all odds, they were going to protect silence no matter what, because that's what Pure Psy is doing. Like some, and they're split. They're, there's differences among the arrows in their ideology, but they're always for each other. And that's their primary goal. Is to Agreed. Keep but, that's, but what I think is the bigger bad is silence falling. Like that mm-hmm. becomes the thing that everyone is fighting either for or against. They're no longer, there's no longer the villain of the counselor. Yeah. Now it's. I don't the- know. I think they're fighting to protect as many lives as possible. Regardless, because regardless of silence falling or not, hmm. but they're not really in control of whether silence is going to fall. They're trying to control it. They're trying to, to support those anchors. They're trying to protect people. Well, they're trying to protect the net, which is different than silence, right? Like they need the net to live. Silence ha- happened at- to live, but like things like with the anchors. I mean, we're getting the ahead anchors, of ourselves. The but- anchors and silence are two separate things. The anchors are just the net. They need the biofeedback of the net to exist. If the anchors fall, the net collapses. Silence is a second issue to that. That's fair. That's fair. That's fair. So, so clarity. They want to protect the. I still don't know that they want to protect the net. Mm, I don't know. I think they. How could they not protect the net? If they don't protect the net, they all die. Yes, I think they. But they're also they're we didn't mention released intertwined. The net I mean, and silence. Silent. No, I don't think silence is intertwined with the net. Silence is just intertwined with their sanity. <laughs> well, no, you're right. It's intertwined because the net mind and the dark mind are broken because of silence. You can't want to protect silence knowing that it's destroying itself. Like continued silence will destroy the net. Anyone who wants to continue silence without addressing the problems that are inherent that are destroying the net, which we saw in the prologue and all throughout, it doesn't make any sense. And I feel like the arrows are are logical enough to know that something is happening and these two things cannot continue in the way that they have been. Agreed. Without changes. Agreed. And I think that issue with the status quo Mm-hmm. Is now the worst thing that can happen. Yes. Yes. The I'm deterioration just... is the worst thing that can right. happen. Right. Right. Who cares about the counselors now? And yeah. Exactly. Address this. That the big bad is now an entity of just the deterioration and the destruction of the net, how silence is contributing to that and all of the people's different agendas. Exactly. I'm gonna use AI to make m- my voice say all of that. <laughs> <laughs> What we didn't mention, though, also very important, is that uh, the Human Alliance, Bowen, discovered that for years, like before Judd, Arrows had dropped out of the net and created their own little network. In oh, this. yeah. And like Judd meets with So much them. plot, man. So much. So much happened in this book, which is also why, like, you can't really skip it. Like, so much actually does happen that, yeah, you can't skip any of them. I'm sure I got overwhelmed. Right. That's probably what 12 years ago I got overwhelmed (laughs) and missed out on the other stuff that was vital. Yeah. We meet some, you know, a couple of arrows. There's a female arrow. I don't remember her name, but uh, in Venice and they had left, they'd figured out some stuff. They did it really sneakily. They hid for a while. They waited. They did it three at a time. It was very methodical. So we haven't known and they're, and they're, they're dead according to the net. Like they were arrows who died on missions and figured out a way to get themselves out in a group but they've been isolated together. And the interesting thing is just like the ghost watching the mating ceremony being sort of longing and jealous, they're asking Judd, how are you living your best life? Like, how are you, how are you doing so well? We're like holed up in this little courtyard because we can't, no one can know it, that we're here. We can't really deal with humans and changelings because we're silent sigh. How are you doing this? And you kind of feel bad for them. You're like, mm-hmm. oh, what's going to happen? Mm-hmm. So much meatiness, so much meatiness. We missed so now, much more. I don't know. There's like a whole other book. You could do a whole other hour on everything else that happened in this book, but yeah. But we're about to get to the book, to the next book, the book where we both kind of came to a halt. And I'm really excited about it. 
Me too. And uh, we've been pushing towards getting this book. Um, Inez is like, yeah, we have to do this week after week. Like, we've been taking two weeks off. We're like, I really want to get to this book. And then I think uh, we'll, sh- we'll do some of the novellas mm-hmm. and the shorter work. Yeah, after. there's an anthology of the novellas. Yeah. So we'll do Which that after. I really want to read. So before we get to the next side changeling, I'm sure you're reading or watching something else. Anything cool you would like to share with the class? I'm still reading, speaking of the class, I'm still reading academic books and maybe I'll share with you because some of them are like books about the psychology of fiction, which I think is really interesting. But, and this is a, be a perfect time to turn the video on for you guys to see Leslie's face when I tell her that I finally watched Poker Face. Oh, I know you wow. loved it. It's been on my to view for a long time. Nice. And I was bored. Or maybe I watched something that was boring. I don't remember. <laughs> and I was like, let me. No, I was trying. <laughs> I think this is on the same channel, um, the same streaming network as um, The Daily Show. And Jon Stewart came back on The Daily Show on Mondays. And I was trying to find. I was trying to play the the Daily Show with Jon Stewart, but it was overloaded. Like I guess a whole bunch of people were watching. It was like unavailable, unavailable at the time. I haven't heard of it before. I was mad. I had like an hour, and so I scroll over to Poker Face and I played episode one, and I was hooked. You'll be hooked by the first one. It's I'm done. Of course I'm done. So Poker Face um, stars Natasha Leone. She um, has this gift where she can tell anytime someone is lying she's like a human lie detector Mm -hmm. and she uh, we meet her when she's working in a casino because she's barred from gambling because they think someone figured the the owner of this the original owner of this casino figured out her trick because they were like she's counting cars does she is she working with somebody and the owner figured out no she can tell when someone's bluffing and so he's like you're fine I won't do anything bad. You're just not not allowed to gamble anywhere anymore. And she basically takes a job with him. And then she, one of her friends gets killed. But the way that this, this, they structure this story is, is genius. So you get the viewers get to see the murder and exactly how it happened and exactly who did it first. Columbo style. And then afterwards, you, she comes on board because she's on the run. And so she comes on board and we see how she's integrated in this person's life. And we watch her solving the crime and we know the answers. But we don't know the why and we don't know how it's going to come out. And it's fascinating it's to watch. Awesome to watch it un, un, unveil. Yeah. Yeah. And I've watched, I've watched the whole thing. That is a great job. I'm glad that you watched it. I'm waiting for season two. Me too. Anxiously. <laughs> Before I forget, though, let me let me this. I have some friend service to save my friend because I I made sure. Did I make sure that you did not watch Sanditon? Or was you I did. not a good friend? Okay, no, no you made I'm sure. A good friend, and I'm sorry if I didn't catch y'all years ago when Sanditon came out. Don't watch that thing. It will. It's not Jane Austen. So you've been waiting, Leslie, to watch Miss Scarlet and the Duke, and now I can definitively tell you, don't bother. The oh. Duke has left the show. What? You should see her face. Oh mm-hmm. my goodness. Mm-hmm. How you I've fall? wasted <laughs> years. I'm so mad. Is it, it, it it's still a show? I mean, it's still called Scarlet. It's now Miss Scarlet. No. Oh. That reminds me of um Sleepy Hollow. We don't have to go oh, into don't. it because it's a lot of pain. I'm gonna pretend I didn't say that. So one thing that I have read recently and really loved is this contemporary romance. It's called The Neighbor Favor by Christina Forrest. And it starts out kind of epistolary where these two people meet by writing. It's a young woman who works in publishing in New York. And she's read this uh, out of print black fantasy book. And she writes the author. And she believes the author is this British man, this black British man who's just, she loves this fantasy. She reads it over and over again. She writes to him. They start writing back and forth to each other and for like a year and they kind of fall in love over email. And then he ghosts her because he's got secrets. Come to find out a few months later, he moves in across the hall. Eventually he finds out who she is. She doesn't know who he is. And, you know, romance ensues in that fashion. But it's delightful. I highly recommend it. It is... It's really sweet. You know, you get an a view of the publishing industry. It's got these young Black characters. One of the themes in her life is her family is kind of Black excellence, and they're expecting a lot from her, and her siblings have done great things, and she feels like the Black sheep because she just kind of hasn't found her footing yet. 
And so she's got this terrible boss that reminds you of the woman from um, what was that fashion movie with a bad boss? <laughs> but with Meryl Streep, I know she's talking. Yeah, about the Devil Wears Prada. Yeah, yeah, Devil Wears Prada type of type of boss. Um, but yeah, it's great. And Christina Forrest has a new book that just came out. So I've read her before. She's good. She's a solid contemporary read if you were looking for something fun and. Wait, is the guy is he is he British? I don't want to. Well, you find out early on that he's lying about that. Oh, because I was I was ready to get the audiobook. Oh yeah, no, it's not going to be. Well, I don't know how they did the narration, so they might do it British in the beginning and then change. But I think oh, that in the first couple no. chapters, it's you know, problem. yeah, that he's he's lying about that, and he he just. But he's got reasons, and they're both kind of broken a little bit, oh. and then they get. It's just you know, romance sweetness ensues. Okay, it's lovely. okay. We all heard the woman. <laughs> so you got something to, to watch and something to read and you also need to read heart of obsidian because we're going to probably start reading it as soon as we get off this call i know we've been waiting for 12 years, 12 years. <laughs> to get back to this book and talk about it right <sighs> and to see if leslie was right right yes i made my predictions i i'm generally good at at because i'm a very close reader i'm like a detail person and so I'm usually good at pick, at finding things like that or guessing things. But it was fun. It's fun to be right. It's fun to be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, I, I, I can't tell if it's, it's more fun to be right or to be wrong. Like if an author does their job right, you can, you know, they can, you can lead a reader through a mystery like that and make them feel smart by guessing it because you've left good clues. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you're totally wrong, it's like, you go back, you're like, wait a minute. Did they, I've read some thrillers that are extremely popular, like 100,000 review thrillers that made me so mad at the end because they were so nonsensical with their twists. They were just like, I'm going to lead you over here. And then without any sort of sensibleness or, you know, uh, what do they call that? You know, planting the seeds, foreshadowing. The twist is going to be something that you could never guess because it makes no sense. And that is never a good feeling. I don't know why those books are so popular, but like, hey, more power to them. When you can lead someone through something where it's mysterious and you're wondering, and you're like, is it this? Am I reading this right? <laughs> and then going back a second time with that in your mind, looking for everything, mm -hmm. being like, yeah. okay, it's interesting. She, I could see how this, the red herrings, I could see leading astray. But it doesn't contradict each other. It does not conflict. And that's important. That's so. craftsmanship. Yes, that is craftsmanship. So, so guys, if you have jo enjoyed us breaking down the craft of Nalini Singh, we want to invite you to let us know what you're thinking. You can leave a comment on YouTube with your thoughts on the episode. You can share it with a friend who loves romance. And please remember to rate and review us on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. And just a, good, a thanks and a shout out to the people who have been commenting. I enjoy reading and responding to the comments and also those who have rate, rated and reviewed us. Thank you. And you can check out our book schedule on our website, inkandmagic.net, to read along with us. And we will see you the next time. Bye. Bye.